I ran marketing departments in corporate America for 10 years and then ran a digital agency for over another 10 years. So I know the roadmap to online success and that formula always includes producing content to share your message from your marketing message to sales and delivery. Hi, I'm Jennifer Neal and you're listening to The Content Toolbox. I believe the secret to finding and creating raving fans online is through you. In building relationships through stories that share who you really are, create genuine, crazy, raving fans that keep begging you to take their money. And on this podcast, we'll be talking strategies, tactics, tips, and more with myself and other industry experts. So buckle up and start your engines, cause it's go time. Welcome, everybody. I am so excited to introduce you today to my good friend, Jamie Atkinson. Jamie and I met, oh my gosh, actually year two of a two comma club coaching group. This new guy comes in and I'm like, who is this guy? He books a call with me. I'm like, yeah, I'll help you out. We hop on a call and (laughs) this is no joke, you guys. We hop on a call and he's like, well, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do business-wise, it could be this, could be this, could be this. So I gave him some advice and he went off and I didn't hear anything from him for a few months. Couple months later, I see him and he is rocking the stage in the podcast world. And I'm like, what the heck happened? And since then I have just watched his growth and I'm like, dude is on fire. So we finally have him on our podcast. (laughs) Well, I am, I'm super happy to be here because it, it was pretty funny. And, and literally so many people said that to me, it's like, Jamie, I thought you were trying to sell to dentists. Like what the hell happened? And like you're on podcast now and, and how's that working? But it's been, it's been a fun journey. I just feel lucky to have amazing friends like you. Cause this is, this has been fun. Like the last year, the people we met amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been epic. And that's the best thing about those networking groups for sure. Okay. So since I just said a little bit about your background, go ahead and tell everybody kind of um, your background and how you got where you are right now. Yeah. Well, so this is actually a brick fuchsia. It's balanced out of the 1890s. Oh, you didn't mean the actual background. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the podcast listeners at home. I don't take myself too seriously. So for any of you guys who don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm English Some people make fun of my accent, but um, I've actually been not in the entrepreneurial world that long. I went and I left my corporate career of selling sofas to little old ladies who um, like spending lots of their, you know, their children's inheritance, which was always fun. And we actually went and, and left and began to travel the world in 2017. And I spent a good two years having no idea what to do. And it's kind of funny that Jennifer started this with the story of me being like, huh, what should I do? Because it was about my sixth or seventh failed business at that point. And it was funny because when I met you, Jen, was the very first time that I'd really done done any major investing in myself. And um, it was, as you know, it's a pretty sizable investment, but you might be surprised to know that before I jumped into that program, the most I'd ever spent was a thousand dollars. So it was a pretty, pretty big, scary moment for me to go and grow and to force myself to get out of those kind of shackles that we were in. But if any of you guys who are are sitting at home right now and you're like, oh, I don't really know what to do, like stick with it because that was my sixth or seventh failed business. I'd done blogging. I'd done writing. I'd done a Pinterest agency. I tried to be a Facebook agency. I tried to help dentists and orthodontists do all of these different things. And then finally, I stumbled across podcasting. And what was really interesting about my whole podcast journey was that I went into this situation of like, I'm just going to go and talk to a bunch of people that I would love to work with, entrepreneurs, people that I want to hang out with. And I'm just going to talk to them and see if I can figure out what kind of business I could run. And two or three months later, I ended up figuring out that podcasting was this incredible medium that you could actually connect with your dream customers, that you could actually sell to people through podcast interviews. I had no idea about this. I accidentally stumbled across it. And it was it was a whole bunch of fun. So that's kind of how I got started in podcasting. And it's been fun since then, Little little over a year since that happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I mean, yeah, your trajectory, you know that you've hit the right thing when you like all of a sudden it becomes easy and, and you're just 
like nailing it. So yeah, I don't, I don't know about awesome. you, but like for me, it was the clarity. Like suddenly I just knew how I could help people. And up to that point, I'd been like dabbling in other people's things, right? Like I take a course and it was like, oh, this is the way that I do it. And I was like, okay, well, I'll do it your way and see how that works. But it was the very first time that I discovered something where I was like, man, like this is my thing. Like I can do this and I can help other people do it. And knowing who I was going to help and how I was going to do it gave me that confidence to be like, oh, I know which way I'm going now. Yep. Yeah. That's freaking awesome. Okay. So because um, I know that the way that you are approaching podcasts is a little different than a little the, different. the traditional, um, can you give us a little bit of an outline of kind of like what you're doing and how you're helping people? Yeah, hundred percent. Cause I think, I think it's a pretty big consensus and you know, this is kind of fun because podcasting is great because people who listen to podcasts, listen to podcasts, right? You guys who are listening to this right now, you already understand the power of the medium, but for people who are new to it, they don't really understand how powerful it is. And, and what blows me away is, you know, the fact that an email list is so incredibly profitable and only 30% of people or less actually open those emails. On average, people who listen to podcasts will listen to 80% of everything you put out. It's absolutely incredible. And that's the average person. So it's this really powerful list that people put out there. But the problem was when I started podcasting, and this is what I see happening with so many people, they have a really hard time making it successful for their business. And when I say that, you know, I'm talking about beyond metrics, right? A lot of us go for this vanity metrics of like, oh, if I can get downloads, if I can get subscribers, if I can make it look really cool and I can, you know, make it look like I have this amazing podcast, it's all going to work out. But a lot of people that I've connected with around podcasting struggle, struggle to connect it back to their business. And there was these very high level people and people that I was interviewing who were seven figure entrepreneurs, had their shit together, like knew how to do marketing, who were using it very successfully. But then there was a lot of people who I saw who were trying to podcast without that marketing experience, without the brand behind them, without a big customer list who really struggled. And, and that was me when I started. I was that person. I was the guy that didn't have a big email list. I had like 250 people who had listened to me go from Pinterest to podcast to all these different things from left, right, center. I didn't really know what the hell I was doing, right? It was this like, who is this weirdo that I'm still subscribed to on this list? And I wanted to help the people at the beginning, all of these entrepreneurs who are listening to what Russell Brunson was saying, what Steve Larson was saying, when they said, hey, you should go and publish. I wanted to help those guys be able to actually have success as well as the bigger guys as well. And the problem was that with podcasting, most people, the way that they monetize it is they say, hey, go and get a lot of downloads and then you can sponsor your show or you can get ads for your show or you know, you can sell something to people at the end of your show. But all of those are dependent on having a really big following. And if you're brand new, it's really, really hard to build a big following. It takes a long time. And I know people in the game and, and I've had people inside of my program who they've been podcasting for, I kid you not, like a year to 18 months. And they're still like, Jamie, I'm only getting 200, 300 downloads. And like, I don't know how to get to the next level. And that was me. Like I started, I wasn't getting a lot of downloads. I had like 60 to hundred people who were listening to my episodes. And, you know, I, I sort of looked at my bank account, looked at my girlfriend, cried on the inside, cried on the outside and said, how am I going to make enough money to pay this $2,500 a month coaching program I just signed up for? Like, I love podcasting. I trust the process. I trust that I'm doing what you tell me to do, Russell, but like, I need to make money. Like I can't keep doing this for fun. So I had to figure out a way that I could leverage the podcast, doing the thing that I wanted to do and actually make it profitable for my business, not in six to nine to 12 months time, but like now today. And what we ended up discovering, and it was kind of funny because we did this completely by accident, but my day job at the time was, you know, we were in Bali and if you guys don't know, we travel full time, which is an amazing luxury. And we were in Bali and we were living in this super like dirt cheap hostel where like the Wi-Fi was about half a megabyte and to get, you know, even a video going was very, very difficult. But every night I would sit and it would be nighttime because, you know, with the U S time difference, it was about a 13 hour time difference. I would sit up every night cold calling these dentist office for hours. And, you know, I don't know if maybe if you guys are listening, you can relate to this, but like, 
just like a lot of you, I was grinding to try and get those customers. And I would make all of these calls every single day. And then I would have all of these sales calls on the back end with all these dentists who hated my guts because I was this young 20 year old marketer and they were some 60 year old dentists who hated marketers like me. And we would have this conversation. And at the end of the month, I would get like one or two sales. And then the next month, like everybody would cancel because they're like, I don't trust this. Right. And it was exhausting. And then on the flip side, I had my podcast. And after three months of doing my podcast, I was kind of like, oh, this isn't really working, but I'm going to keep doing it anyway. And I did this interview with this dude who was an entrepreneur. And on this podcast interview, we were just talking about the thing that I was obsessed with, funnels. And we were talking about marketing and funnels. And we had this great 30-minute interview. And at the end of this interview, you know, about three days later, this guy reaches back out to me and he's like, hey, Jamie, that funnel stuff you were talking about, that sounds pretty good. Like, can we get on a phone call? I was like, yeah, cool. Let's like chat some more about it. And then after that 30 minute phone call, I was kind of sitting in my chair and I looked over at my girlfriend and I'm like, that dude just wired me $2,000. And she was like, what do you mean? I thought this was a podcast interview. Is he a dentist? I'm like, no, he's an entrepreneur. He just paid me $2,000 because he wanted some help with his funnel strategy. And it, and it clicked for me. I was like, wow, Like somehow of everything I'm doing, instead of doing all of these cold calling with these people that don't trust me, I've just connected with this guy who is absolutely my dream customer, an entrepreneur I love. And I've connected with him. And 30 minutes later, he's like, man, dude, I need your help. I trust you. Here's $2,000. Let's run with it. And it was an amazing relationship. And it, it really ticked this box to me that podcasting wasn't just this medium to go out and get in front of an audience. It was this platform for you to connect with your dream customers. And after that first sale, I was like, man, I'm going to give this a go. So I sacked off all of the orthodontists. I was like, screw you guys. I'm going to go try something different. And I spent my whole time that next month just interviewing people who I was like, these are my dream customers and they might be a fit for me to help them with the funnels. And I ended up doing about 10 or 15 interviews. I fumbled my way through them, trying to figure out how to get these people to buy in a really genuine way. And at the end of the month, I had less download numbers. I had had these conversations with all of these different people who really like actually wanted to speak to me and didn't hate me like all of the orthodontist did. But crucially, I closed another three deals. And that month we did nearly eight to $9,000 worth of revenue, which was like three times as much as we'd done any previous months. And that's when I knew I was like, wow, we've got something here. And then over the next couple of months, we ended up, you know, telling more people about it. I ended up doing a Facebook group and, and it's really just exploded from there. That is so fantastic. I love it. Sorry if there's any dentist listening who got personally victimized by that message, but like, it's nothing against you. You're just not my people. (laughs) Hey, you know what? I tried working with financial advisors for a while. There's some that I love, but not my people's. (laughs) Um, Okay. I'm going to pause this really quick and shut the window because I'm getting some background noise. Sure. No worries. Uh, I don't know if you can hear that or not, but I just want to make sure. I, I wish I had some elevator music or something that I could play. Okay, so I want to unpack a little bit of what you just said, though. Um, namely, because I'm a numbers nerd when it comes to numbers and monetization of what we're actually doing. So, Using, so just to clarify, you guys, Jamie said up to 30%, like 30% or less of emails get opened. Industry standard across the board is 20% of emails being opened. And then of the people who are actually clicking and taking action, it's typically like 1% of those people. So yes, email lists are super valuable. um, And those are the numbers that you're dealing with. So to have an 80% listen rate or full open rate and click rate, like we can compare it to that in terms of taking engagements, that is huge. I mean, the only other thing that you get like that kind of engagement is text messaging. And you know what's crazy as well? Like 80% is the average. Most people actually consume 93%. So the average does 80, but I like a lot more people listen to a lot of it. And if you think about like that, and and I know you're kind of like salivating at this idea, because like from a numbers perspective, it's crazy because what that means is, Hey, instead of 10,000 people on my email list where, you know, I'm going to get like 200 people that are going to, you know, or 2000 people are going to open it or whatever. Now I've got, you know, 1800 to 5,000 people on my podcast list, but almost all of them are consuming almost everything I put out there. 
So if you do 30 minutes a week, an hour a week, two hours a week, four hours a week, these customers are so heavily indoctrinated into you, they are just going to do whatever you say. And, and that is the secret power that most people don't realize yet. Yep. It's creating a tribe with people who are like just listening and engaging. So yeah, it's beautiful to think of it as a an attraction technique. It's a lead I, generation. Technique. I honestly think of it almost as a second list because, you know, and, and it's great to look at people like Joe Rogan because, you know, they're obviously the leaders of the podcast industry with what you see out there. But what I love about that is that if Joe Rogan had made a Facebook group, like he couldn't have sold his right. Facebook group for a hundred million dollars because Facebook would be like, no, Joe, we own the group, not you. But like your podcast feed, it's something that you own just like an email list, right? And that's why Joe has been able to say, hey, no, I'm going to go and exclusively put it out on Spotify and that's the way that it's going to work. And that's the power in it. And most people don't realize this, but if you look at all of the really great marketers, especially the high level ones, they are so into podcasting because they recognize if they can get their existing customers or their new leads to go and consume the content on the podcast, they're going to become indoctrinated so much faster. And we, while I love that, and I think it's incredibly powerful, especially for high level marketers, that's why I also want to make it you know, known to these people at the beginning, like, yes. You can get that in the long game, but don't forget, like there are other ways that you can also take advantage of it right now. And, and, and that's kind of what I'm all about is, yeah, we're going to build you that long-term asset, but let's make sure that you get paid at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Don't worry, guys. We are going to let you know where to get a hold of Jamie. So The bar, usually. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually accurate. <laughs> Um, okay. So if people are just getting started with a podcast or already have one, what kind of steps would you recommend for them to shift into this model of thinking? I think the, the biggest thing is you have to have a really clear idea of who you actually want to sell to. And, and, and there's this really interesting different way that we get people to position their podcast. And, and I can give you two examples to kind of demonstrate this. But if you take, you know, and I'm going to use this as an example because everybody and their dog has tried this at some point, is if you are a Facebook ad marketer and you want to sell to chiropractors, right? How many of those guys are out there? There's a lot, right? The traditional approach that you would think to do a podcast would be, I'm going to make a podcast where I talk about Facebook marketing and I'm going to talk about the pixel and the ads and all this, that, and the other. And if you think about it from a content perspective, if you're trying to sell to a chiropractor, how many chiropractors are going to be interested to listen to a marketing podcast? Well, one, not, not, not that many, but the ones that do want to listen to that podcast probably have enough interest in it that they'll be able to do it themselves, right? There's only going to be a very small percentage of those people who are going to listen to it and say, you know what? Okay, I'm going to hire you as my ad guy. But what we encourage people to do is to think of it in a slightly different way. And we say, well, if your dream customer is a chiropractor, why don't you go and interview chiropractors about growing and scaling their business. And one, you're going to speak to your dream customers every single day on the podcast. And a lot of those people, because you've built a relationship with them, they're going to want to sign up with you anyway, right? Great. You're getting paid to go and do your interviews because a lot of them become clients. But anybody that listens to that show, who is going to be interested to listening to chiropractors who are talking about growing their business? other chiropractors who want to grow their business, right? So by speaking to your dream customer and interviewing them about their business and how they're growing it in the different ways, a couple of things happen. The first thing is you attract more of your dream customer. The second thing that happens is you're speaking to your dream customers. So you can actually sell to them. But the third thing that happens, and this is probably my favorite thing from a long-term perspective, is that you become the expert in your thing. So if you look at regular marketing podcasts, what they would probably go and do is they would interview other experts about Facebook. Facebook ads because it's a Facebook ad podcast. And what happens is you become the reporter, you become the interviewer, you don't become the Facebook ad expert, right? If you look at Joe Rogan, what do you think of? You think of a interviewer. If you look at Pat Flynn, what do you think of? An interviewer. If you look at JLD, what do you think of? An interviewer. But if you go on somebody else's show where you're the marketing expert 
who helps chiropractors and you interview chiropractors, whenever marketing comes into the conversation, you are the expert. You're the person that's bringing that conversation forward. So you can stand out as that person that's being highlighted in that interview as the person that you would go to for help. So it becomes this really powerful kind of trifecta where you're getting sales for doing interviews. So therefore you want to do more interviews. The more content you create, the more people you attract. And and that content that you're putting out is actually highlighting you. But what's really, really powerful about it is you have this power of association. If you go out and interview a hundred of the most successful chiropractors in your area, you become associated with those chiropractors just by interviewing them. So even if you sucked and you only got five of those people to become customers, you're still being associated with those chiropractors. So if anybody else comes into that industry, it's like, wow, that dude is speaking to every chiropractor I know. He must be pretty legit. What does he do? Are we sells ads? I need ads. And that's what we really teach people is to think differently about how you position your show. So you can still go out and create those solo pieces you want to create. You can still talk about the things you want to talk about, but just by shifting the approach of your show to actually be focused on who is my dream customer and what would they be interested in talking about on my show that runs parallel to what we do. And it's the whole reason, Jen, why I don't have a podcast about podcasts. My podcast is all about creating mass movements because by doing that, I get to interview people who are creating mass movements and a lot of those people are going to want to create a podcast. And whenever I interview them and I'm always the person that's bringing the podcast conversation forward. So it's a different strategy and it's going to be different to some people who are at the seven or the eight figure level because they might want to go pure content. They might have enough leads coming already that they just want to indoctrinate the customers. But for everybody else that's doing under seven figures, under six figures, it's a different approach to doing the podcast that can really start to elevate the brand. So that's how we do it a little differently. Does that make sense? Oh, it totally does. I, I love that approach. It's funny, like we're actually, I'm following along and in, in your same footsteps. We've been doing this now for almost three months. And, wow, that's huge. And uh, and, and yeah, we're, I've been doing um, two episodes a week. You know, I do the solo episode and I do the interviews and it's so much fun. Um, but I am finding also that I'm getting people who, it's kind of like I get to do... I guess I would sort of almost equate it to like when the, the, hmm, the power of a, a mastermind when you're doing the hot seats and mm-hmm. you're, you're getting like that one-on-one coaching with other people like chipping in and stuff. Um, that's sort of what's happening here that you're doing live. It's like you're doing live hot seats and then you're using that to attract more people who want the exact same thing. And what's nice about it is that you, as the interviewer, you know, you get this, hidden behind the scenes view where you get the very best stuff from the people that you interview without having to buy their program without seeing in. I mean, I can't tell you like, this is crazy. So I'm just like this, like 20, when I first launched my podcast, I was like 27, hadn't had a successful business within the first three months of me launching my show. I got to interview a billionaire on my podcast, self-made billionaire, no funding running uh, like a CBD marijuana style business, whatever, like massively exploded. The dude was on my show for an hour and a half. And I got to ask him about whatever I wanted about how he had built his billion dollar company. Like how much would you pay as a consulting service to go and do that? Like that would be hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay to something like that. And as a podcast host, you get that for free, which is so cool. That is so true. And it's, I mean, it's, part of the power of a podcast because it's like, it's your show. So you're automatically establishing that authority. Um, yeah. And, but- and it's fun. One of my, one of my good buddies, J.R. Rivas, he, he was actually at an event before the very first Funnel Hacking Live that I went to. And he shared a story about um, Hugh Hefner, right? The guy who runs the Playboy Mansion. And, you know, trust J.R. to tell a story about Hugh Hefner. If you see him, he's the prettiest man you'll ever see in your life. But it's kind of hilarious because what he said was that whenever anybody would go up to Hugh Hefner and say, hey, Hef, we're like throwing a party. Do you want to come to our place? He would always say, no, but you can throw the party at my place. And the reason he did that was that he always wanted to be the guy that was hosting the party. And like, you can't do that in the modern day. Like, I don't know, people will tear you down. But nowadays, the modern equivalent of something like that is to go and have your own platform, to have your own podcast. You can host people. They come to you and you become this facilitator of great content and it opens so many doors. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what I love most, even about this, to get kind of back to content, uh, where you're talking about using 
engaging in just a genuine live conversation. I know you do your podcast live as well, but just in like totally engaging in that way creates that authenticity in your voice, which creates, which really helps to create that authentic message, which is what people are naturally drawn to anyway. And I know that podcasts by nature are so much easier to just be like, Oh, this is my voice. It's just a conversation. It's just conversational, right? Yeah, it is. It is. But, but I think that we still tend to make it too hard or we try to make it into this marketing message or this, this thing that sounds like, Oh, I have to be more authoritative, which actually ends up pushing people away because all you have got to do is have a free conversation. I think this is the biggest piece of advice we give to everybody. You know, everybody who starts inside of our program or, or reaches out and they're like, Hey, yeah, I need, I need that editor because I need them to get rid of the ums and ahs. And when I fall over my chair, I'm like, no, like you got to keep that stuff in. That's the best stuff out there. And, you know, I was just talking to you, Jen, like we're relaunching our podcast on August 4th. And what, what's so exciting about it is that it's me and my girlfriend and, and you know Gina and she's hilarious and she's way funnier than I am and she makes fun of me constantly but we constantly are making mistakes and tripping up each other and making stupid jokes and that is where the gold of the conversation lies and I always whenever anybody talks about authenticity with content I always bring them back to probably the most h- hilarious or politically incorrect example of like Logan Paul like everybody hated Logan Paul in 2018 and 2019 he was that dude that did you know that thing with the kid in the forest and they hated it and and it was terrible and it was horrible what he did but the way that he revitalized his image was by being just himself on a podcast. And he launched a podcast and it was him and his buddies. And they just talked about the real state of what it's like to live in LA in the age that they are with the people they are with the influence they have. And they were just real and they were just themselves. And people fell in love with the person that he was because he is a charismatic dude. And you know, whether you like him or whether you don't like him, you can't disagree that he's completely rebuilt his image from what is arguably a moment, which he could have never recovered from. And the way that he was able to do that so powerfully was through content but the podcast was one of the biggest factors that helped him to get through that because you can't hide authenticity in a podcast. You are either yourself or you're somebody else. But if you just submit to being yourself and making your stupid jokes and being the way that you are and just accepting that, people love that. Like They become attracted to you because they can see that authenticity. And what's great, and I know you do this all the time, is but we use the podcast as this kind of pillar content. We go and like share that in other places. You know, you see Joe Rogan doing it, you know, does a three hour biopic and you're like about exhausted by the time he's done, but then he chops it up into these really interesting seven or eight minute bites. And that's so powerful because you can sit down and blast out a really fun conversation. And if you just have a team come in and get the best bits and then it becomes this ammunition you can use everywhere in your marketing. Yeah, absolutely. Preach it. Thank you. That's exactly what we do. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what we do as well. Like not as a business, but we do that in our business yeah. because it's super smart. Like, why would you not? And it's really interesting that you talk about the authenticity of podcasting because, you know, I, I bet it's difficult. Like if you sit in front of a camera and you say, hey, I'm going to record an eight minute video right now and it's going to be valuable. It's going to be all this and it's going to have this stuff and you're going to like that, right? And, and it becomes this kind of scripted, forced, you know, even when you're being authentic and even when you're telling a story, it's never quite as authentic as a conversation. And that's the power of podcasting is that when somebody asks you a question and you have to answer, it's not pre-rehearsed. It's not pre-scripted. It's unconscious flow of just who you are and it yep. just comes out. And, and that's what I love about it anyway. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think everybody has this superpower because you can just start talking and and it's always like, you're always in the general direction. Sometimes you kind of go off path or down rabbit holes, but you're always in the right direction. Hundred percent. Then you get done and it's like, I don't even know what I just said, but you know, and then I'll go back and listen to episodes later and I'm like, dang, it kind of sounds like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It sounds like I actually, yeah, (laughs) I've got something between these eyes that nobody thought that was there. Right. (laughs) Through you, Mrs. Johnson from the second grade. I'll show you. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so yeah, a lot of what we talk about is is that authentic voice and storytelling, and and I think that podcasting just lends right naturally to that. And and also, I think podcasting, but in a video format like we're doing, because there's so much that comes through in the the facial expressions and. Yeah. I I mean, even in the, even in the, when you're not responding, right? Like when in a podcast, like you might, I might say something 
and you respond in a certain way and people don't catch that if they're listening. But if yep. they're watching, then they can. And, you know, it doesn't, doesn't take anything extra to, you know, just turn on the webcam and do it when you're in a Zoom meeting or something like that. It doesn't take any extra time. Maybe you have to brush your hair. But other than that, like, I mean, I never brush my hair. So <laughs> I guess maybe you don't even have to do that. But it gives you that extra makeup, I mean, it does take a little bit more of it. It's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Get the blush going. That's happened to me a few times. I, I wouldn't care to admit it, but yeah, you're right. Because having that extra dynamic of the video just makes it so much more widely accessible. I mean, we're running ads now as we start to grow our business and, you know, we do podcasting and we do joint ventures and we start to run ads. But what's really powerful now is that we use these clips from the podcast episodes from other people's shows. And this is, this has been great because recently, you know, we've been on somebody else's show just like we're doing right now, Jen. And if there's a clip that we love, we'll be like, Hey, can we run ad spend to your podcast? Because we want our audience to see that episode. And that sounds crazy. Like, why would I pay money to go and send my people to somebody else's show? But if you're on it as a third party, as an authority, it can be incredibly powerful. And that can drive so much revenue for you and so much trust and, and on those levels when you're going out and producing content. So it doesn't even necessarily have to be your own content. You can still capitalize from other people's content you put out there. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Great tip. Okay, so we, we talked about a few tips here. Let's talk about um, a few mistakes, things that you see commonly that you, people need to avoid. The, the biggest mistake is always overthinking it. And, um, and the reason why this is a mistake is that one, if you don't start, it's never going to happen. And, you know, I've been, I've been a victim of this myself and, and, you know, you get in your own way. And even with this brand new show, because, you know, we've had a podcast for so long, we took a hiatus from it about two months ago as honestly, if I'm, if I'm being real transparent, Dren, Dren, Jen, that's not your name, Dren. I mean, you know. <laughs> Thanks, Dren. Um, <laughs> but like to be really, to re be really honest with you, I fell out of love with the process. Like I was doing these interviews. I wasn't enjoying it that much. The questions weren't really giving me that much out of it. And the content just wasn't great because of that, because there was a lack of passion. So we went back to the drawing board. I took a two month break and me and Gina came up with a new idea of what we wanted the show to be. And it's a lot more fun. It's a lot more lighthearted. It's me and her making fun of each other, the marketing angle from me and the, you know, the, I guess the, she's the operator in our business. So she has that mindset of hers. But what was interesting is that going back to the drawing board and rethinking how we wanted to have that show just made it a lot more fun. And I forgot what the question was, but anyway, that I just want to say overthinking. Oh, mistakes. Yeah, 100%. So, yeah, this happens a lot, guys. <laughs> <laughs> On a different direction. But the, the big mistake that we had was that in redoing our show, we got into this perfectionism mindset where it's like, oh, if we're going to relaunch our show, we need it to be great. We've got to have all this equipment and we've got to, because we're the podcast people, it has to be as good as possible. And we really got into our heads about it. And, and you know, we beat ourselves up about, oh, the show, it's got to sound better. The show's got to be a better angle. And eventually me and Gina were like, you know what? Like we need to take our own advice. We tell all our people, like it's about imperfect action. And that's what we did. And a month ago, we set the launch date and we said, okay, it's going out there. We're going to do that now. And since we did that and we just dropped the whole, you know, oh, it needs to be perfect, the content has just flowed and it's become much easier. So the biggest mistake that I see is this idea of overcomplicating it. You don't need fancy equipment. You don't need fancy microphones. Like, yeah, we've got it now, but like, it's because we've done it for a year and a half and our whole business is podcasting. That's why. But everybody else, you can get started with a microphone or just those basic Apple headphones that come with every phone that's out there. You can just do that, plug it in and start recording. And the second thing, which is the biggest mistake, exactly, right? Like, and if the podcasters didn't see that, Jen grabbed her phone and went, ooh and like talked into it. Yeah. But the idea is that the first thing is get out of your own way. Stop being a perfectionist. Just hit record on that first episode. And the second thing is consistency. The only way that you will grow your following is by being consistent. And it's so crazy, but you know, um, one of, one of our, our good friends who's actually inside of Russell's in a circle program started a podcast about 18 months ago. And he said this exact same thing. There was somebody else that was one of his competitors that launched at the same time as him. And they had probably a hundred times the spending power of doing this launch. And he did this launch and it was epic and it was grand. And they got all these people and competitions and they blew him out of the water, honestly. But he just kept publishing. He did an episode every two days and every two days and every two days. And he just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And his competitor, they did it for three months and then they, and then they stopped for a week. 
And then they tried to do it again. And they're like, hey, guys, sorry, we missed last week. And they started again. And then they were inconsistent again. And they had a couple of weeks where they didn't show up. And then they had a two-month gap. And then they started back up again. And his show, he just kept being consistent, doing it, doing it, doing it. And then you look back now and 18 months later, his show has grown to literally millions of downloads. And their show is not even a tenth of where his is at. Not because of a big marketing budget, not because of a fancy show, because of consistency. So those are the two biggest, biggest secrets is really just to one, get out of your own way and start the damn thing. But two, make sure you do it in a way that can be consistent. I say to every single one of my students, don't overcommit. Like start off doing one episode a week. And then when you're three months ahead of your content, and that's not three months of recorded episodes, that's three months of recorded, edited, uploaded, scheduled with the date, with everything in, like once you're three months ahead, then start doing two episodes a week and then get three months ahead again and then do it. Because if you try and bite off more than you can chew and you're not consistent, then your audience punishes you. They, they show up for an episode and then it's gone. You know, and I remember there's a funny story about me and some donuts, which I won't share the whole caboodle, but I used to always, when I was younger, I would go to a bakery and at four o'clock every day, the lady was there and she gave me discounted donuts because it was, you know, the, they were changing over the donuts or whatever. And every day for a year and a half, me and my friends showed up and we would get a donut. I don't know how I wasn't 900 pounds, but I guess I had a good metabolism or something. But so I did that. And then, uh, you know, a year later, they changed over the lady to somebody different. She didn't do that thing anymore. And then we went probably a couple more times and she said no again, and we never turned up again. And that level of consistency for your audience is exactly the same. If you can show up every single time that you say when you're going to do it, it doesn't matter if it's once a week, once every couple of weeks, but if you're consistent, people will continue to show up. And that's the biggest mistake that I also see. So those, those two things, getting out of your own way and being consistent and not biting off more than you can chew is probably the biggest things that will give people long-term podcasting success. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. hundred percent agree. And it is sometimes like if you haven't started yet, it's still scary, especially if you're an established business. Cause it's like, no, it's gotta be right. This has to be polished. Like, no, cause you'll want to cam the first hundred episodes anyway. So just start doing it. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and, and I was chatting to a buddy in Stanley the other day and he's, you know, been super successful and, you know, he's got an amazing business. And he said the same thing. He's like, Jamie, like I've been in my head about starting a podcast for the last 18 months. And every time I plan on doing it, we say, we can do this and have a studio and we can fly people out and we do this. And it ends up never happening. I said, why don't you just start the damn thing? And, you know, and you're funny. People will listen. You've got a following. Just build it up from that. He's like, yeah, it's easy. I should do that. It's like, yeah, you should do that. <laughs> yep. And there's, there is something about $10, the power $10, No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, is there anything else that I have missed, uh, just in conversation here that, that you would like to recommend or, or share with? I think the biggest thing is for, for everybody out there, the number one thing that, that I can't say loud enough is that podcasting is a huge opportunity right now. And if you're not in podcasting, you're crazy because it's the fastest way to actually grow a massively successful business. Everybody you see, Russell Brunson didn't have ClickFunnels until he started his podcast. And then six months later, like suddenly he's got his business and it took off. And you see the same thing happening. Steve Larson, Russell Brunson, um, even people like Alex Sharfin with The Momentum Show. His, show, his business went into momentum once he actually started the podcast. And most people don't see this and they don't realize it, but having a show is the fastest way for you to get clarity on your message. It's the fastest way for you to understand the direction that your business can go in. And what we specifically help people to do is to figure out not only how can you get those things, but how can you make money at the same time? So if you're in this position right now and you're like, well, this sounds cool, but like, honestly, it's the fastest way that you can grow. And so many people hold themselves back for so long because they don't get that clarity on that message. And the podcast is the fastest way to pull that out yourself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's why I started here as well. Love it. There you go. Okay. So I love this question. You ready? I'm ready. What is the most surprising thing that has happened to you personally or in your business since you decided to go full, full in as an entrepreneur? I think the most surprising thing, there's probably two, 
the, the, the one that I will have to mention because my other half will kill me was finding the love of my life when I went to travel. I was you know, say, not, I not, know. Many, not many people will you know, fly to Thailand from England, fall in love with an American girl and then follow her back to America. It's not, you know, my, my sister said, what the hell are you doing? I thought you were staying in Southeast Asia. Why are you flying to America? What are you doing? I was like, oh, I fell in love. Sorry. So that is definitely the first one. And the second most surprising thing, and this was counterintuitive to everything that I've been told my entire life. I had always been told, keep money to the side, save money, have it there, have the safety barrier, have the backup. And it was only when that safety barrier got removed and I was put in a position where I said, okay, Jamie, you have to make money or you're not going to eat, that I grew. And I went from having a safety barrier in my bank account while traveling and doing $1,000 more or less every single month for 18 months to spending the last of the cents in my bank account, signing up for a program I couldn't afford. And I went from doing $1,500 or however much I was doing every month to within the second month, I'd done 10,000. Within the third month, we'd done 20 to 30,000. And today our business is at nearly $500,000 in revenue and run rate. And it's all because I got rid of the safety nets and it was completely counterproductive to everything I'd ever been taught my entire life. But doing that, investing in myself and putting myself in the position where if I didn't succeed, I was going to die because I didn't have food. That was the secret. And it was removing that backup plan. And I'd always, my whole life always had a backup plan. I wouldn't go to a new job. I would just go for the promotion because if it didn't work, I still had my job. But if I went for a new company, there's risk and this, you know, I stay here. It's a better backup plan. And instead, it was the first time I really bet on myself and said, I'm going to go all in. And doing that gave me that ability to have to get it done. Because the, the truth is, none of us are ever going to starve. Like, it's very rare. And I know someone's going to say, oh, people starve every year. But like, in reality, us entrepreneurs that are going out there, you're not going to starve. You are still going to have somewhere to live. You're still going to be able to figure it out. But if you put yourself in that position, you force yourself to succeed. And that was the, the biggest thing that, that ever happened to me that blew me away. Like, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. That is so true. And I have heard that from so many people. I've even experienced myself. And it's like, it's like the, um, like the, the tightrope walker. Like when you remove the oh shit net, <laughs> you're going to become a better tightrope walker really yeah, you're fast. you're going to die if you don't do this very well. So <laughs> you better do it properly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so awesome. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. Um, I know we're running up here on time, but let me ask you, where can people find out more information about you, follow you, your podcast? Give us all the details. Well, I would love for you guys to go check out our brand new podcast. It literally has just launched a couple days ago. So please go into Apple, onto your iPhone. Um, it's not in Spotify yet, so definitely make sure you steal your grandma's iPhone if you don't have one. But go type in Change Makers Podcast with Jamie Atkinson and Gina Tino, or just Change Makers with Jamie Atkinson and Gina Suzanne, I should say, not Gina Tino. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble. But go check out our show because I would love for you to come and listen to the first episodes. It's really value packed. We've got a ton of stuff that we're giving away. Um, but it's honestly just a lot of fun. Gina's hilarious. And if you liked what we were talking about here, then you're going to love that show because we've got so much more value to give. So please jump over there and, you know, subscribe and check it out. I'd love to have you guys over. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, as always, you guys, we'll be talking with Jamie about sliding a little something extra into the content toolbox resource area. So you get some extra goodies there. And uh, good and happy to. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing all that wisdom and, um, and changing the face of podcasting. Bye guys. <laughs> all right. Bye guys.